Thank you for joining us at the ever-improving No Sound Bites Allowed podcast. My name is Michael Vasquez. We thank you for joining us in this adventure of describing the politics that go on in our nation on a personal and local level as often as possible, giving you, the audience, more than just 30 seconds to understand what's going on in our nation. We look forward to joining you as we go to sit back, enjoy the ride. Please remember, if you like the episodes, like it, share it, let other people know, and if you can, please donate, even if it's $2, even if it's 5 because it all makes a difference. We thank you, and here we go. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone is well. And this is your host, the Dragon of the Southern Tier, Michael Voss, and I I think we're going to have a fun episode. Well, sort of fun, because I tell you, it was a very trying week this week. There's a lot that went on. You had the State of the Union address, and that was quite interesting. And that'll be part of one of the segments here. And we had the revelation from Governor Cuomo and how it's affected people. But before I get to either of those two things, I do want to take a moment just to... uh, One, I recently saw a video on YouTube, and I think it's of interest. A lot of people may find it interesting. It's a John Peterson. He's from Canada, a professor, and he has a very interesting outlook. I would highly recommend to anyone to check out what he was uh, saying in a recent interview he had from January 24th um, that the actual event happened in Britain, and it's been circling around the internet. I know about five, uh, five million people overall between Britain and here in the U.S. and YouTube, have seen the interview. It's about a half an hour long. But it's actually very riveting to see the politics that are going on right now and how there are some who project their viewpoints onto others without the other person having said anything. It's kind of the experience that I've had, and if you've heard me over at the SUNY Broom Republicans podcast, which I am a co-host of, uh, which you can look up and you'll see it there. I know that a couple of people we've had recent interviews with, a uh, Carney Carney Burns and Paul Cuesta, uh, have mentioned they're black Republicans as well. And they had mentioned how they on a college campus have gotten this uh, pressure to conform, to live up to a standard and an ideal that has nothing to do with their lives, their beliefs. And we see that a lot these days. And in that interview, I think you'll see it as well, how the interviewer projects her personal social justice agenda onto John Peterson, literally in the interview, changing his words as he speaks them to her. He literally is saying something, and then she turns it around to fit her social justice mindset and mantra and trying to attack him based on her ideals, which have nothing to do with what he is actually saying directly to her. So it's kind of interesting, and I do recommend that to a lot of people. But the thing I want to start off with, uh, separate of that, is just my experience recently. Uh, As many people may recall, back about uh, November 28th, thereabouts, I had a health incident. Um, on April 6th, I'll be 50 years old and, uh, whether my voice gives that away or not, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty physically fit for a 50 year old guy, uh, no gut and feeling well. And, uh, but at the same time I had some pain in my chest. I think I talked about it here on the show here and I, I know I put it out on Facebook as well. And it had been a pervasive pressure and pain in my chest and it had been persistent for over a week. And so I went into the local hospital here in Binghamton, New York, which is called Lords, one of them. And I went in there and thought it would be just a four hour checkup, wound up being 32 hours. And oh my God, what a bill for that. I didn't have health insurance at the time, uh, mostly because I disagree with Obamacare. And I don't, I don't agree with a government mandate requiring me to take an action because the government decided that that's what they want me to do. I disagree vehemently with the government telling the people to do things as if 
the government has greater control or power than the public. That's not what America is about. We're about the fact that we, the people, get to choose and our government reacts to us. We have all the power of government and government has limited powers that we allow it to have and only those powers that we allow it to have. And that's nowadays somewhat of a unique viewpoint, especially if you believe in the progressive mindset where they think that government is the best choice and the best decision maker and that the public is second to that, which I disagree with. And they believe that their mantra is that government creates rights and imparts them upon us. So health care is a right to many of them because government says so, which is absolutely false. And we, and it is not part of our government at all. It's not part of the constitution. It doesn't exist. Instead, we have a right to choose and we have a freedom to choose. Um, they believe that government has a right to pick winners and losers in terms of industry and business and just about anything in life. Uh, you know, things like the green energy industry where they, where government has been proven to be wrong 75% of the time and growing. But instead, I believe we have the right to fail. So that's my opposition to Obamacare. It's a fundamental belief that government does not have a right to tell me things that I can choose for myself. That's just a fact. Now, that doesn't mean that healthcare isn't, doesn't need reforms. It most certainly does. And the cost of healthcare is abhorrent. It, it's horrendous. And I learned that firsthand. I don't even want to tell you what the cost was for the checkup, which is still ongoing. I'm still going into checks. But my point is the healthcare and the, and the services that I received from Lords were excellent. I, I think they did a very good job in running tests and making sure that I'm in as good a health as possible and to try and identify why I had these pains because it's very atypical. I had an atypical, uh, presentation of chest pain. So trying to isolate it and identify it, which is a little tricky. As part of getting checked, I had to take on Obamacare. It was the requirement of the hospital since I was being checked and I didn't have insurance that I had to take that on as the government requires the hospital to provide. So I did. Now, without any Obamacare, I was open to a wide range of choices on how to address my health care. And we went through a series of tests, including the EKG, looking at my heart, x-rays, everything. Went through a whole series of uh, items to make sure that I was okay. But, and going forward, that was fine, and I was going to pay for it. It's very expensive. And... Lord said, Hey, you know, we know we'll look at your income. We'll look at everything and see if there's anything we can do to help you with this because it is expensive. Fair enough. I love it for that. In the meantime, I got my health care through the government, Obamacare. Yay. And it was, was it inexpensive? Sort of, but there's a higher cost to it. And here's the thing that gets me. I was scheduled in January to have a checkup with a cardiologist. Okay. And part of that is to do the stress test and some of the other tests that cardiologists do to try and determine if there is, if stress is the factor because there were other factors weren't showing. So maybe it was stress or stress induced uh, chest pains or something else maybe going on that only appears under stress. And I was scheduled to go in, get the test and see the cardiologist and get results and See if that explains what's going on. And it's kind of funny. I go in, take time off of work to go in to take this test and this exam and to try and figure out what's going on with my health, my personal health. And I wound up running around in Lourdes for about two hours, back and forth between a couple of different departments before it was finally figured out that the reason why one department saying I should have a uh, appointment and it's scheduled in one part of the hospital. I go there and that department saying, well, no, we don't have you scheduled check back at the other place. And they're going back and forth a couple of times. What we finally figured out was 
that my health care carrier, HMO, or whatever you want to call it, the, the Obamacare, turned it down. The Obamacare would not let me get a cardiologist exam for a potential heart condition that I had emergency care for. This is what you get from Obamacare. This is what happens when the government interferes with the individual choices and individual lives of its citizens. Obamacare said, because I wasn't, I was atypical and not showing the normal series of uh, symptoms about my health that they denied my ability to be able to check, be checked for any other causes or reasons and would rather, essentially the government was saying at that moment, as I'm supposed to be getting this exam, that the government thought that because of my age, my atypical uh, presentation, that the risk of me dropping dead was acceptable versus actually allowing me to take the exam and have my insurance covered. That is a scary thought. This is what people mean when they said, and I myself said it as well in many articles, that the government has a death committee, that essentially the government, through Obamacare, is able to be able, is able to choose the types of care and services that the individuals on its program will be able to receive. The government is dictating that, oh, you have these kind of symptoms or in this situation, so you're only, you only have available to you these approved kind of choices. And even if there's something that could potentially save your life, you'll be denied until the very last moment, if at all. Because that's very real for me. I very really was told that I cannot get a cardiologist, part of the cardiologist exam for a heart condition that was potentially life ending because they didn't think it was typical and they didn't approve it. And so I could not be seen. And if I had turned around and had a heart attack that same day, what would have happened then? Would I be able to sue the government if I had survived? You know, would that, and like that's a priority at that point. No, but they put me in danger and that would have affected my job, my friends, um, the work that I do on the nonprofits that I work on, this work here on the podcast, the other podcasts that I work on and produce, really? All because there's someone, an accountant, and I don't blame them per se because that's the system that was created for them to work in. And they've been given a chart and a series of actuarials that say, if a person fits this criteria, you do these things and we will approve them. And if they don't fit this criteria, we don't approve it because we need to save money a government that's $20 trillion in debt. We need to save money by denying people potentially life-saving services because the checkbox didn't get checked. Really? I take that personally insulting. And, and, and it, I mean, it's life-threatening. And by the way, it is now, that was the second week of January that I was to be seen. And in the second week of February, I may finally get approved to be able to go in and see the cardiologist and get this exam done. I, I, I generally believe there was probably a lot of stress and that's what did it. But at the same time, a 50 year old black man, black Hispanic, uh, who doesn't normally present and has continuously had pain in his chest, you know, you want to get every exam done you can and you want to make sure you take care of it. Now, mind you, in the meantime, what did happen is Lords, the private institution that it is, was able to help me in terms of the payment for the 32 hours that I was in the hospital being checked on. So I had a private institution, a private hospital, help me more than the government that mandates that I must have coverage and is taking money from me every month, but limiting my options. And the institution, the private institution, that's helping me 
gave me everything, everything, every service that they would give anyone else, regardless of money. And they're helping me on taking care of that payment and taking care of that service because I deserved the best quality care I could receive, regardless of the cost. The cost was second to my health and my life. But the government, the cost is first, my life is second. That really didn't start my week off very well. I was pretty upset, as you might imagine. That's why I don't like Obamacare. And that's why when people tell you that Obamacare is not good, and that it's the worst thing that could have possibly happened, and that it's not just flawed, but it's fundamentally taking away freedoms from Americans and potentially taking their lives as well. That's my example of it. And so all of the pundits, all of the proponents of Obamacare, that's fantastic. And if it's working for you because it's cat catastrophic care, fantastic. I'm happy for you. But my personal experience matches what I expected it to be and why I opposed it because the government endangered my life. And I don't agree with that. But what I will do now is I will take a break because there are other issues to talk about. And some of them are very important as much as this. And it, by the way, if you have health issues, do go check them out. I'm not big on doctors. I'm not big on hospitals. But, you know, if there's something that's seriously going on, get checked out. I always recommend that. But let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and get into the next segment. glad to be back with you here. That's right, this is No Sound Bites Allowed, and your host, Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier. And in the first segment, I was just talking about the cost of losing your freedom, the cost of Obamacare, the cost of the government saying that you must do something, whether you wish to do it or not. And it, the hope was that Obamacare would somehow give people more. And in fact, as my personal experience has been, Obamacare took away from me and has potentially endangered my life by not allowing me to have the kind of coverage I need to make sure that I'm going to be okay. That's scary. And that's the problem. When government interferes with personal matters, you get this disconnect and this loss of freedom and this loss of freedom affects your life. And I think it's, it's pretty pervasive. And the reason why we see this is also something that we saw at the state of the union sometimes called SOTU, S-O-T-U. Uh, what, what happened is that uh, the State of the Union, we have President Trump, 
he made a very, very centrist speech. So centrist, in fact, that CBS News polls, and CBS is no fan of President Trump, uh, came out and showed that 75% of the people they polled were thought it was a great speech. And that when they broke it down, it was about 97% for Republicans. It was about 40, excuse me, 74% for independents and 33% of the Democrats that had watched it, that they polled, all thought that it was a very good speech, that it was a very bipartisan, open uh, compromise was given, that it hit all of the things that we expect our government to do. But yet we hear from the Democratic leadership, which is mostly progressives, kind of like Senator Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, the representative, uh, Representative Sherry, Cheryl Jackson Lee, and so many others on the Democratic side that just hated it, couldn't see anywhere that they would be able to compromise. In fact, they, several people, like Representative Jackson Lee, brought criminals to our Congress. There's something. Tell me that's not upsetting. How can it not be upsetting that a representative who is elected by citizens to represent citizens to enforce and create laws for our nation to instill order in our society and to make sure that people are treated justly and let me be very clear citizens are treated justly went out and broke the law by aiding and abetting an illegal alien who had violated our immigration laws and presented that person and, pre and had to shield and protect that criminal from prosecution of the law at the State of the Union. That's not a statement. That is a violation of law. That's just insane. Think about it. If Representative Jackson Lee had decided to take a drug dealer, a heroin dealer, and took them to the State of the Union, to say, oh, I don't agree with the opioid laws and programs. Would anyone be cheering that? That she took someone who is actively poisoning our children. If she took someone who is actively killing Americans and she brought them there, do you think she'd get the same reception that she expected to get? That progressives and Democrats would say, that's a great thing. At a, at a boy, at a girl. Great job. If she took gangbangers who are in the middle of Chicago and they're running around killing innocent citizens, the highest death rate in the entire nation, and in fact, more than several nations in the world, just in Chicago alone. And if you were to take that, if she took a gangbanger and brought them to the State of the Union to protest the way we are addressing gun control, do you think anyone would stand there and say, we support you on this? This person who has murdered innocent people, children, endangered families, ruined families, endangers people's lives and actively is breaking the law and seeking not to be prosecuted. And I have to say, when I say aiding and abetting, it's strong. Let me be very clear here. I mean that because you don't get to just walk into Congress just because you want to walk in. This isn't a 7-Eleven. This is the House of Representatives, the Congress itself. You have to have identification proving who you are. You have to be searched by the uh, Secret Service, the FBI. There are police officers, state and federal police officers, that are surrounding the entire grounds. To be able to get in there, you have to go through several security checks. So to be in the State of the Union, the only way that someone who is an illegal criminal, who is evading prosecution of the law, the only way that they could get in is if that representative, that representative of citizens of the United States had to actively create a circumstance to allow that person to be in there. They had to violate the law and use some kind of political clout that shouldn't exist 
to treat this person above the law and to do things that citizens could not do. That's insulting. That's insulting when you think about that. And most people don't. In the news reports, you're not hearing that in the news, that she aided, allowed a criminal to evade prosecution. I mean, think about it. If she was bringing in a member of ISIS who potentially had a bomb, okay, and she gave them the way through, so she cleared them through all the police, all the security checks, and that person had a bomb, and they blew up something. If that illegal alien had a gun and tried to kill Trump or tried to do something else disruptive and violent, would everyone be cheering? The fact that it didn't happen doesn't change the fact that it should never have been possible. And we should call these representatives out. The Democrats, they're really progressives, that allowed this to happen should be called out, each and every one of them, and they should never have elected office again. They should be prosecuted and they should be in jail because they violated the law and they believe in their actions that they are above the law and above the people they are there to serve. But that wasn't the only thing that pissed me off about the State of the Union. Oh, no. Oh, no. You may have seen on my Facebook post uh, where I had on February 1st, I had reposted something that was found uh, by a few people. Now, there's something called the Congressional Black Caucus, which is just a coalition of every black member of Congress, theoretically. And, and that, I say theoretically because if you are a Republican member of Congress, the, con the Congressional Black Caucus really doesn't want you in it, and most of the black Republicans are not invited in. Or when they are, they're severely limited in access. But in general, they are ignored. They're not considered black members of Congress and are not in the Black Caucus, which is kind of insulting. But that being said, during the State of the Union, President Trump identified several great things for the nation. Unemployment is down amongst blacks, Hispanics, women, all, t if not multi-decade lows, they're all time lows of unemployment. And he identified, you know, the success in what's going on in our economy. The economy is doing exceptionally well. Jobs are being created. Companies are coming back from overseas back into the United States, and they are bringing billions of dollars with them. 300 companies have returned to the United States and repatriated their money. About three trillion dollars, I believe, was the last thing. Three hundred, excuse me, may either be three hundred billion or three trillion dollars has been brought back to the United States, along with a million people who have received raises and uh, bonuses that otherwise would never exist. And there is tens of thousands of jobs that are now being created because of this. This is a success. And everyone in America should be pleased because this is good for everyone in America, even the illegal aliens. Everyone is improving. This helps our economy in every aspect of everything we do. This is a benefit to our nation. And the Democrats, they sat. The progressive leadership of the Democratic Party sat stone-faced unwilling to acknowledge that the quality of life for Americans is improving. They're the same people who said they support a minimum wage. Well, the people you're supporting to get a minimum wage just got a raise. You should be happy. Nope. They could. Nope. They're not happy at all. Didn't have anything to say. Not a clap out there. What about the Congressional Black Caucus? When they hear that this is an all-time low for black unemployment, and by the way, you can check this out at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, all-time low in black unemployment. And they sat there. They didn't just sit there stone-faced. According to Chip Small, I'm going to mess up his name, Somo de Villa, who is a, he works for Getty Images as a staff photographer. He was there. He was taking pictures of the members of Congress during the State of the Union in 2018. 
And he took a picture of members of the Black Congressional Caucus as they were playing video games. Video games. They're playing Candy Crush rather than acknowledging that the quality of life and the opportunities for black Americans that they claim that they got elected claiming they represent and that they are fighting for. Well, guess what? This is exactly what they were fighting for to get them better jobs, to get them better pay, to get them jobs when there was no jobs available. This is what they campaigned on. It happened. And because it happened under a Republican president, a Republican Congress, they sat there playing Candy Crush instead. You know what that tells me? When I look at the violation of law, when I see that the endangerment of the of our uh, legislative uh, branches and our executive branch, when I see that we have people disregarding the law and placing themselves above the law, when I see that there is a disregard for the very citizens they are there to represent and an insult to those people by not acknowledging the betterment of their lives, I have to say to myself, I don't think they really care about the things they say they care about. Because if you really care about improving someone's quality of life, that you're there to get them more jobs, you're there to get them more pay, you're there to improve their quality of life, and when those things happen and you don't care, then you never did care. It wasn't your priority. Otherwise, you would acknowledge that it happened. But the fact that they don't want to acknowledge it and denied it, actually, after the State of the Union, they were actively saying that this had nothing to do, this is, didn't happen. It's not a reality. It's not ongoing. It's not about Republicans. It's not about Trump. It's not because we lowered the um, business corporate tax rate, which literally none of this happened before we had the tax, uh, the tax cuts, that they're saying that none of that matters. It's not important. It's not a factor. And we shouldn't acknowledge it. And we shouldn't applaud it. And we should denounce President Trump for doing what they were elected to do. That's insanity. That's someone who really doesn't care about the people they're there to help. No, no. When you're, when that's the reaction they have to the improvement of lives is, well, you know, we didn't, we don't get to, since they didn't get to claim the credit for having done it, well, then it's not worth talking about. When that's your reaction, you're not there trying to help other people. You're there for yourself. This is about power. It's about control of power and the way people think and the, what people can do. And that's insulting. So that was very upsetting to me, but it gets worse this week, even worse. And I'll be right back in the next segment. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how much worse it got, at least in the state of New York and to a certain extent, other states throughout the country. But we'll talk about that in just a moment. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming back. That's right. This is the f- most popular show. That is the No Sound Bites Allowed with your host, Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier. 
and I'm happy to be here with you. Yes, I am. And folks, I just, you know, I, I'm talking to you about a bunch of things here that I think are really important, you know. <laughs> That's right. It's a bunch of truth. It's a lot of truth about what's going on out there. That we're seeing the real impact of Obamacare on people's lives. You know, with, with the cost of the deductibles being so insanely high that it's not affordable. That coverage of health care, potentially life-saving services, are denied just because it doesn't match checks bo- checkbox that the government decided arbitrarily should be there. That's a problem. That is a major problem. And we're seeing also at the same time that our representatives, some of them, the progressive far left of the Democratic Party, that they're out there, that they can't even acknowledge the few things that have improved, that when government is doing its job and when it works properly, and we see that the quality of life has improved for people across the nation, millions of people having an improvement in their lives, they can't acknowledge it. They just can't even deal with that. I mean, that's insane. That is... uh, That's right. It's truth. It's the truth that they don't want to acknowledge. And that's kind of insulting to everyone. But it gets worse. It gets far, far worse. Because in this week... Well, I can't say far, far worse, but it does get worse because in the same week we had the insult from, well, the most favorite person out there, Governor Cuomo, you know, the same gentleman who's been working on his presidential campaign since 2016. And it's pretty well known amongst most people throughout all of New York State that Governor Cuomo is using his position in the state of New York as a means to get elect, uh, to get the presidential nomination for the Democrats in 2020. And pretty much everything he does is based around that. And his goal is to get the progressive base of Democrats to support him. That's not what most Democrats are. I mean, the rank and file members of the Democratic Party, many, many, many people I speak to, do not agree with the far left. The far left is a real small segment. We're talking about, you know, like citizen action. They're what, 1% of the population of the state of New York, but yet they have immense amounts of power somehow in the state of New York amongst Democrats, mostly because of the amount of money that they put together and the amount of manpower they put out whenever it comes time for an election. They run around everywhere trying to get signatures and put down signs and to malign anyone who doesn't agree with what they say. I've had that experience just in the 2017 mayoral debates in the election here in Binghamton. Citizen Action went out of its way to, well, in particular, their candidate, Tariq Abdelazine, attacked me verbally uh, at the, the second debate which was witnessed by members of the press. It was actually videotaped by a member of the press. And they didn't care. Citizen Action, the far left, they thought it was perfectly fine that they could attack and besmirch the reputation of myself and other members of the elected officials in the city of Binghamton, and that they could say anything they wanted because, well, they're smarter than everyone else. Because they know better. Because they're the best solution. And that's why they lost. Because the average Democrat, and by the way, there's more Democrats in the city of Binghamton than there are Republicans. And, you know, if if it was only on the basis of Democrat versus Republican, and that's the only criteria, then Tariq Abdelazim would have won. But that's not the reality. The fact is that the progressive left are not well received by the rest of the nation and most Democrats, that they don't represent them and their ideals. And this whole thing about social justice, that's the far left. That's not what rank and, pile, rank and file people believe at all. But I'm detracting from my main point, which is about Governor Cuomo. Because Governor Cuomo decided that he wanted to grab some headlines 
going into this election cycle and wanted to set himself up well for 2020. And he decided to take on the issue of rewarding criminals. Now, I'm not talking about immigration, which he has already said that he wants to violate the federal law, immigration law for our nation, and allow New York State to be a sanctuary state. That's a criminal act. That's a criminal act. And you know what? I would have a lot of respect for him if he said, in fact, I'd say that about Representative um, Jackson Lee, if she had said when she admitted on air on C-SPAN that she had violated the law, broke the law because of illegal immigration, if she had also said, and I should be prosecuted for this because I broke the law. If she admitted her wrongdoing and was willing to pay the con- the price for the consequence of that, I'd have respect. I'd still think she's stupid and wrong, but I'd have respect. If Governor Cuomo were to be honest with the people of New York and say that he decided to reward criminals because his progressive base think that's a great idea, you know what? I still think it's stupid and wrong, but at least if that was the case, you know, you got to have some respect for him for saying that's what he believes is important. But that's not what he said. And I have to tell you, uh, what he's doing as a reward is he is giving every inmate in New York State, every convicted criminal in the state of New York is going to be able to have a tablet, basically an iPod. I call it the iPrisoner. That's right. He's going to give an iPrisoner tablet, an electronic tablet to every prisoner in New York state so that they can look at videos and music videos and read books and be able to contact their family. And I have to say, where's the punishment? Where is the punishment for being in jail? I don't know how many millions of people of the 19 million people in New York state, there are millions who don't own a tablet. They don't have an iPad. Most people don't have this. It's too expensive. And they don't get that, but the inmates will. And that's something I can't understand. There are kids in schools who can't afford books. There are kids who are in uh, SUNY and CUNY. They're going to college and higher education that can't afford tablets but they could use them to be able to look at the reading material for their courses and their classes and to improve themselves and to get a better education. They don't get this. If he had said, I want to give this to children and families in need and the poor, well, that's one thing. No, he said he's going to give it to inmates. Why? Why in the world would you do that? Why would you reward someone and give them something that the average citizen does not have and you're going to give it to them instead? Please explain that logic to me. And the answer that they provide is, well, this will help them um, reintegrate into society. This will get keep them connected with society and give them a reason to go back into society and be productive people. And I say, that's bull. That's not what it's about. Because realistically, whether or not you are able to see the latest Jay-Z, Britney Spears, whatever artist you want to point out, to be able to see their music videos and to say hi to your son or or daughter, one of your kids or your family members on an iPad, doesn't make you more or less likely to go out and sell drugs again, to go out and mug old elderly people to go out and steal. They're not connected. One has nothing to do with the other. And that's a luxury. That is a luxury item. It is something that most people do not have because they cannot afford it. That is a benefit. And for the prisoners, that is a reward. And why would you give them this reward? I do not understand a reward that doesn't make them better at doing a job. You come out of prison and whether or not you had an iPad and whether or not you know the latest songs that have been going on in the country while you were locked up doesn't make you suddenly a good worker. It doesn't make you employable. 
it doesn't help. That's not what it's there for. It's a means of entertainment. And that entertainment doesn't help. And I, I also reject one of the other arguments, uh, one of the other things that people say to justify this is, well, at least it didn't cost anyone anything. It didn't cost the state any money. No one, it's not coming out of taxpayer dollars to provide this. Well, I disagree. And let's think of the reality here. There was no direct taxpayer monies that were used. So these I prisoner pads, no, the government didn't buy them and then give them to the prisoners. The government has a contract with a company called JPAD, and their grant, JPAD, is to be able to provide the tablets and services, which means the internet access, to be able to get to the music videos and everything else on the internet for these prisoners, uh, that JPAD provides it. And JPAD provided the tablets. Isn't that great? Well, you're missing something. Who gave the money to JPAD for that? JPAD is paid by New York State. They have a grant. They have a contract with New York State. New York State paid them for something that New York State wanted them to do, which is to give the prisoners a, a, a JPAD, to give them a prison, uh, an iPad, uh, a prisoner pad. So the government paid it. We paid a company to provide a service for the criminals. It's indirect. We put a middleman in there. So even though Governor Cuomo wanted to give it to them directly, rather than do that and say, have everyone say, that's not where my taxpayer dollar should go. And if you're going to give someone an iPad, give it to kids in schools. That's something that most people would agree with. But to avoid that argument and to look good amongst progressives, he gave the money to someone else. And that person did it for him. A sleight of hand. It's not me. It's that guy over there. By the way, you forgot that six months ago I paid that guy so that he could do it now. Well, that's kind of stupid. So you can't tell me that the taxpayers didn't buy a bunch of iPrisoner electronic tablets. Yes, we did. And we gave that money, plus extra money, to an company called JPAD so that they can give them to them. It's insulting. It's an insult to our intelligence to say that the taxpayers didn't pay for it. Of course we did. But more insulting is the fact that we are rewarding these criminals while there are children and parents and families that are in need that could either use those funds to feed themselves to clothe themselves, to help kids educate themselves. And if we must give someone an, an electronic tablet, let's give it to kids in need and give it to the public, public school students so that they can use it to educate themselves or at least even entertain themselves because they are far more worthy. And if I have to have my tax dollars go to that, matter of fact, not just my tax dollars, but a brand new tax from Governor Cuomo to take away the money. Remember, in the second segment, we're talking about all this extra money that's coming into the nation to help benefit people. And they're going to take that money. Governor Cuomo is going to take that money away before you get to spend it with a brand new tax just because you got extra money. So he can use it to pay for programs like giving the eye prisoner to inmates. That's insulting. So this was a bad week. It was a bad week, not because of all the things that happened. There were a lot of good things that happened. But it's because government, at, at all kinds of levels, is actively interfering with our lives and taking away our freedoms and making decisions for us that make no sense whatsoever that we would never do ourselves and telling us, well, don't worry about it. You're too dumb to understand it. It's the right thing to do. I'm sorry. I disagree with that. That is not the government being servants of us. The governor is not serving the public. He's serving his own political interests. We're not seeing Congress, the Democrats in Congress, serve the people. They're serving their own political gain. 
We're not seeing Obamacare help people. They're helping the government figure out who gets to live and die and who they're going to give money to to get certain programs and tests done. This is a troubling trend, and we should all be very, very aware of it. So this was a difficult week. Hopefully this gives you something to look into. Now, you don't have to agree with me, but I look forward to hearing your thoughts on it. Because if we don't talk about it, I guarantee it can't get better. But this has been the Dragon of the Southern Tier, Michael Voss, talking about this. And I look forward to seeing you next week in our next episode. Be well, everybody.